Thank you, Yogesh. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking um, my colleagues and friends in Bangalore for this uh, wonderful opportunity and also for uh, starting this uh, very quickly uh, during this terrible time. And it's really a nice thing. And I'm really happy to get this opportunity to talk about a recent work, which um, as Yogesh said, uh, Partho and I am working. Partho is currently uh, completing his PhD here in Delhi. So the model what I'm really going to talk about is what we call a last progeny modified branching random walk. And branching random walk is now a very hot topic in research in uh, probability theory. Uh, we have tweaked it a bit and I'll uh, describe that model um, soon. Um, so here is a brief uh, sketch of what I'm going to talk to you today. So I'm going to give an introduction to branching random walk for people who are not necessarily familiar and will give you a brief history of it. In no way it's comprehensive. There are enormous amount of literature in brand branching random walk. I'm just going to touch upon the things which we need for um, our work. And then I'm going to describe to you that what um, uh, we are calling a modified branching random walk and then we'll describe the main results, which will take the majority of the time. And then I'll tell you that why we stumble upon on those results and how, and um, give you the brief idea of the proofs and will indicate some interesting future directions is going to die and is going to give birth to some number of offsprings which are then displaced according to some point process which will going to denote by this bold phase z these particles then forms so called the first generation and they are going to behave independently and identically as that of their parents and they are going to be independent among each other more precisely, after an unit amount of time, at time n equals to 2, each particle in the generation 1 is going to die again, just like the, um, their parent, and produce a number of offsprings which are displaced and are going to be positioned respective to the parents by independent but identical copies of the point process, which is going to be give, uh, denoted by this z. The process so formed uh, by continuation, so we can continue this uh, as many times as we want, and it will create a process, and that's what is called the branching random walk. So it has two type of uh, mechanism uh, involved in it. The branching, which comes because of the particle dies and produce various number of offsprings, and the offsprings are then displaced from the position of the uh, parent and that gives the walk. So this is both branching and uh, walk together, everything being done randomly. So that's uh, our, our term being used as branching random walk. And a classical example can be obtained by the following thing, that if we look at a point process, which is very simple, that it has only two random points, both are independent and identically distributed, standard Gaussian. So which means each particle is going to split in two. It's going to die and split in two. And each of these two children would be placed according to independent standard Gaussian displacement. Okay. So that's a very classical uh, process. And here is the schematic of that classical process. So each of the age weights here, they are, um, can, you can think them as the standard Gaussian one for these classical examples. And each particle splits in two and they further can split in two. And if you look at an NH generation, say the last one displayed on the picture here. And if you look at this particular particle, its position is going to be obtained by summing up all these Gaussian variables along the unique path which goes all the way to the 
first particle or the root for this particular tree structure. All right, so this is just a schematic, okay? So various particles would be positioned at various uh, positions on the real line, both positive and negative. If we have, um, for example, in this case with the standard Gaussian, it may become positive or negative. All right, so if we look at this genealogical tree of the process, we denote it by this bold face T. This is nothing but a Galton Watson branching process where the total, uh, the progeny distribution is given by the total mass of this point process. We'll denote it by this little n or the capital N in more precisely. Um, and the for classical example is just going to be a binary uh, tree just in this picture, right? Okay, and we'll denote by SV, we'll try to be less notation as much as possible, but a uh, few things we need. So we'll denote by SV the position of the individual at um, generation N, say, uh, the individual V. At the generation N, suppose in the classical example, there will be two to the power N many uh, particles. If it is uh, not uh, a constant branching, then it will be a random number of things given by the corresponding branching process. So each one of them has some positions which will be denoted by the corresponding S. An interesting statistics which people look at is the maximum of these positions so that the extreme that how far it has gone to the right, and that's why it is often referred to as the rightmost position, and being looking into the rightmost position will denote it by Rn of this branching random walk. Now, what are the real difficulties of such process? This is essentially, if we look at the classical one, it is essentially maximum of a lot of Gaussian uh, variables. So what is so much uh, uh, difficulty in it? The difficulty really is the uh, reason is that they are highly correlated. The uh, variables for which we are going to take the maximum, there are, um, could be very, um, a lot of correlations can be there. Um, and what is the reason for that? The reason is very simple. If we look at, say, the classical example of this uh, binary branching with uh, standard Gaussian displacement, and if we look at two particles U and V at the nth generation, and we look at its covariance, it is very easy to see that it must be exactly same. I, I have written this big O, let us not bother. Uh, let's just walk through the example. The, it is exactly the distance of the least common ancestor from the root, right? Um, that much of correlation will definitely going to be there because that much of correlation comes because of the common path between the U and V to the root must go through the least common ancestor. And uh, if we do a little, active interest in uh, recent days and branching random walk is a very good prototype example of such thing and again the reason being that because of the tree structure the paths between two particles must go through the least common ancestor okay now here are the uh, schematic uh, of the history which is uh, fairly extensive and once again i'm not um, going to give you the full history but the ones which are uh, interesting and related to the current uh, uh, process which i'm still haven't described to you but i'm going to do that in uh, one or two slides so the process really started uh, by hammersley in 1974 it was quickly studied then by Kingman and Begins in successive years, and they established the strong law of large number for this rightmost uh, position in a linear scaling. So what they proved that Rn by N converges almost surely to a constant, and the constant was also exactly characterized. A real breakthrough happened around uh, some about 
five years later by Bramson, he was a young uh, researcher then. It's related to his PhD thesis and, and about um, another five years down the line. What he proved that if you look at a continuous version of it, so you consider the, again the classical example of a binary branching with standard Gaussian displacement. Instead of that, you led to an, an unit uh, time, right? discrete time. Instead of that, you suppose you do the following, that you start with one particle let it uh, remain alive for an exponential amount of time. And during this time, it's going to move like a standard Brownian motion. After an exponential clock has ring, it's going to die. It's going to produce two independent uh, particles, which are going to walk independently through different uh, two uh, standard Gaussian, uh, standard uh, Brownian motion and the process continues in that way. That, that's called a branching Brownian motion. So Bramson studied that and he proved that there is a centered limit and it becomes a solution of a, a equation which was studied by Stallwards much earlier um, called FKPP in name of four Stallwards, Fisher, Kolmogorov, uh, Petrovsky, and Piskanov. And uh, a solution of it in uh, called the traveling well solution is the live centered limit of this process it was proved by Bramson in uh, two successive papers which in 1978 and 1983. And he also showed a very interesting thing that uh, although begins proved that there is has to be a linear um, scaling at the level of the strong law of large number, but when you do a centered limit, uh, it needs a further correction, which has a logarithmic term. And that got later on termed in the literature as a Bramson correction. Uh, people usually call this logarithmic term as the Bramson correction. In around, uh, 1987, uh, Lali and Selke uh, gave a more probabilistic interpretation of this uh, traveling web solution to FKPP uh, through conditional limits related to uh, branching Brownian motion. Um, then much later, around 2000, a student uh, who worked uh, not directly with Bramson, but in the same department, uh, proved that for the discrete process, there is a centered limit for IID displacement with log concave uh, density. This paper is somewhat obscure, yet uh, it's quite interesting that a lot of results were proved. For example, the classical case with binary branching and uh, standard Gaussian distribution was essentially settled by Bachmann in 2000. This is a part of his PhD thesis. When I was doing my PhD on a completely different uh, topic, we observed that uh, one can easily prove that um, um, when you center it by the median, um, this Rn, the rightmost position remains tight under very mild condition on the, on the displacement. Um, and again, on under IID displacement. Um, but it was then uh, pointed out by Harry Keston um, that uh, essentially our argument can be seen in um, Hammersley's paper, which we did um, looked into and figured that indeed that is the case. Um, around 2009, Bramson and Zaituni showed similar tightness for more general process satisfying same recursive relation. I'm not going to give this detail because it's not quite relevant for the talk which we are going to um, really heading to. Now, again, breakthrough happened in 2009 by two independent groups. What they proved that if you look at Rn and do a linear centering, then the second order fluctuations in terms of probability limit and not uh, exact weak limit, okay? So um, second order fluctuations in probability is of the logarithmic, um, um, of the order of logarithm of n, where n is the generation. And finally, in 2013, as many of us know, that IDECON actually proved a great result and uh, hold on, this is not no good. Let this thing be disappear. That Rn, when centered by a linear term, C1n, uh, but it needs a further Bramson type correction 
with a constant three by two and a constant C2 log n converges in distribution to a non-trivial limit. And he also characterized the limit. Now the C1 and C2 are constants which depends on the underlying point process which drives this uh, particular process. Now I must say here that I am only concentrating on the light tail displacement case. There are uh, many excellent work in recent days by many of our colleagues uh, in the Institute for um, the heavy tail case. Now the heavy tail case is not what I'm going to concentrate. That's why I'm not giving that uh, part of the literature, but there is a lot of beautiful work in that uh, domain as well in, in recent days. Um, now, what are we going to look into? So what we are going to look into is what we call the last progeny modified branching random walk. Again, it will going to be a discrete time process. Time starts at zero with a particle sitting at the origin. And it uh, does the same thing, just like the branching random walk, that it's going to die after an unit time and produce some number of offsprings which are going to be displaced according to some point process, which you are going to again denote by Z. And they are going to produce the first um, uh, generation. And the particles in the first generation um, going to um, do same thing independently and identically as that of the parent. And we'll let the process run up to a generation N. Now comes the new thing. So once this has been done, so the process has run up to generation N, exactly like in the classical way, we are going to give each particle a further shift, which are IID and going to be of the form, which we are going to write as one by theta and a random variable XV. And these random variables XVs are going to be IID. Now theta is like a scaling parameter, but not quite, which we'll see later. And the distribution of XV, I will tell you in a minute that what are the distributions we are going to take. And this distribution of XV and this parameter theta, which is a positive constant, are going to be two parameters for this new model, which are going to call last progeny modified branching random model. Now, this is a, um, a quick observation here that if we take theta equals to infinity informally, then all these new innovations, if I call them, they're going to be killed. Once they are killed, we should be back to the classical process. Okay? But this is informal, okay? because uh, theta is a constant, we cannot just replace it by infinity. So this is like the schematic. So up to this uh, nth generation, we are going to work exactly like the classical process. For example, this picture is for the classical example of binary branching with say standard Gaussian displacement. After that, we are going to give some innovative uh, displacement and the process which are we going to look into um, is after this displacement has been given. So if we now look at the backbone of this genealogical uh, tree of this process, it's like a Galton, it's mostly a Galton Watson branching process tree, except these last leaves which come in this uh, picture, for example, right? Okay, and we are again going to denote the progeny distribution as capital N, which is the total mass of the random point process Z. And by site abuse of the notation, we are still going to call um, the particle uh, after giving this innovative uh, displacement as SV is the position of the particle. But we will note that when we say that the, the position of this particle also needs this displacement to be counted in. Okay, All right. And we are going to look into the same statistics, the rightmost position. But now because of this uh, new displacement given at the nth uh, uh, generation, we're going to call it Rn star. The star denotes this modified version. Okay, all right. So few remarks here, which are very important to observe that the modified version is different, but perhaps not too different. This is a wishful thinking, okay? We really want to think it in that way. Um, however, we observe that the similar difficulty of strong correlation exists in this case also of exactly of the same nature. The two paths of U and V will be correlated up to 
the least common ancestor. Okay. We'll perhaps like to see that RN star and RN has similar asymptotic, right? Now, few points to be noted here that if XVs are just constant, then it will only be a constant shift. And hence, the whatever we are saying that we'd like to see similar asymptotic for RN star and RN are in principle true, except for a shift. However, if we make XVs depending on the generation N, then the results can be drastically different. And there has been some amount of work in that direction by various people, started by Fang and Zaituni in 2012 and many others later on. They call it inhomogeneous. Um, branching random walk. So if I give something, uh, so our model can be essentially be seen as a generalization of their work if we allow these innovations to depend on N. However, we are not going to do that, in the, not in this talk. So in our model, we'll take specific type of distribution for XVs and here it uh, is this specific distribution, okay? And, um, and um, uh, you will see why in a uh, little later, but this is uh, the type what we are going to take. The, our innovations XV would be of the form logarithm of YV by EV, where YVs are going to be IID with some positively supported measure, say mu, and EVs are IID exponential distribution with parameter one. And this set, YV and EV, are going to be independent with each other. Okay, so each XV is nothing but logarithm of a ratio of a positively supported variable divided by exponential variable, which are independent of each other. And we're going to take the logarithm of that ratio. And that is the innovation being given to V. And each V going to get completely independent innovations. So this is the specific model which we are going to look into. Few notations which we really need. One is the so-called the moment generating function of the point process uh, Z. If we write the point process as uh, the points as Zij's, the total number of points being N is the total mass. And then our M theta, the moment generating function is given by this expression right here. You don't need to remember the expression. Just remember that M denotes the moment generating function of the uh, point process. And we'll, we'll take the logarithm of that moment generating function that the so-called the cumulant generating function will denote it by nu. Uh, note that uh, moment generating function being an exponentiation and then take an expectation, this nu is going to be a convex function. Now, a few assumptions which we are going to make, we're going to assume that the moment generating function exists for a lot of values of theta, in particular for all the positively sub uh, uh, parameter theta and few negative where zero becomes an interior point. And this is exactly where I make the assumption essentially that the displacements are light tail. So for the heavy tail cases are not going to fall into this domain. And uh, second assumption is a non-triviality assumption. We assume that Z is a non-trivial um, uh, point process and the extinction probability for the underlying branching process is zero. Uh, if there is some positive ext uh, um, extinction probability, we can do conditional arguments. So just for sake of simplicity, we're going to do that. So in other words, what we are going to say that N doesn't, uh, it, N is not one almost surely. The uh, point process is not going to concentrate only on one point with um, almost surely and um, N uh, would not be allowed to take the value zero at all uh, so that the branching process has no extinction probability. Okay. And we also assume that the uh, progeny distribution N, the total mass of this uh, point process Z has uh, little more than first moment. So one plus pth moment exists for P little bigger than zero. These are quite classical assumptions, okay? All classical works kind of have all these assumptions. Now, um, um, uh, for uh, stating the uh, results, I need a specific constant. This is a very well-studied constant in the branching process, but, uh, uh, and also in branching random walk, but let me define this. This is called the parameter theta naught, 
this is uh, nothing but the following quantity that it is the infimum value of all positive theta such that new theta by theta is exactly equals to new prime of theta this is a terrible thing to uh, write uh, no one would understand anything about it it is much better to say it in this way that this is the curve of new i look at the tangent on this curve from which passes to the origin then its x ordinate is going to be theta not note that new is a convex function so such a theta not must exist if it exists then it must be unique now the problem is it may not exist the, uh, such a thing might just become an asymptote and uh, so theta not can be infinity mm, it's okay that's okay that's not a problem okay so there could be a possibility that theta not is infinity otherwise theta not would be finite and but whenever theta not is finite it is an unique point and uh, we need this our assumptions which uh, we made uh, to make this thing go through in particular the assumption that uh, the progeny distribution has one plus pth moment is very important for this okay and also the finiteness of the moment generating function Okay, so now I'm going to break uh, various different cases based on this parameter theta. Theta equals to theta naught would be called the boundary. And below theta naught would be called below the boundary and above theta naught would be called the above the boundary. Of course, this case is only possible provided theta naught is finite. Same is with the boundary case, okay? if theta not is finite if theta not is infinity then we are always in the below the boundary case okay now our first result is uh, essentially a result like begins that if we look at our rn star then for any positively supported measure mu which is not delta zero we have the same almost sure limit as n tends to infinity for rn star by n for boundary case and above the boundary case, the limit is necessarily new theta naught by theta naught, which is the answer for the classical branching random walk was proved by begins in 1976. However, for below the boundary case, the answer may depend on the value of the theta and it need not only depend on the value of theta naught. It is new theta naught by new theta by theta. Okay. But as long as we are on the boundary and above the boundary, the limit is only depends on theta naught and not the value of theta. This is already quite interesting. Okay, so that's the remark I made here, make here. And now I'll tell you the centered weak limit results. There are a lot of things written here, which is not so important to see. What is important to see is that we get this uh, centered uh, weak limit for Rn star, where the linear centering is uh, whatever it's supposed to be. However, we also get a logarithmic uh, correction factor. And we get the following um, limiting random variable, which needs a shift as a constant. And that is, of course, should be there because we are already giving some independent innovations. And the shift is also coming as a very natural object in some sense the scaling is there and is the logarithm of the mean of the uh, yvs remember our innovations are logarithm of yv by ev so and we get a detailed description of the limiting object through something as the limit of the derivative martingale and we can also explicitly characterize that what is going to be the constant uh, in that uh, limiting distribution so this is uh, to make the following comment that the coefficient for the linear term is exactly same as that of the centering of rn as proved by IDECON in 2013. However, the coefficient for the logarithmic term is only one third of that of the centering of Rn. So what we thought that it's going to be similar is not the case. There is difference at the level of the Bramson correction. 
the constant in front of logarithm changes. The limiting distribution happens to be similar as that of ITECON, which is a randomly shifted Gumbel distribution. Now, I'm, what I'm going to do in the next slide, that I'm just going to superimpose what IDECON did on our result. So the reds are the only difference. So let me just do it once more. This is our result and this is IDECON's result. The only difference is that we IDECON proved for the classical case of RN. We are going to do it for RN star. The linear term remains same. The logarithmic term gets a factor three. Ours is one third less, okay? And the constant term in our term, uh, uh, case missings because of course it comes because of the new innovations. And uh, one good thing about our work which kind of complement IDECON's work is that IDECON could not characterize exactly the constant C which we have been able to do explicitly that what is the constant. Okay, so to move on to uh, why are we calling this a boundary case? Quickly, let me tell you, it, uh, this slide may become um, a little uh, too much for others, but uh, for the sake of the experts, um, <clears throat> theta is essentially a scale parameter, okay? Thus, one can try to scale the process in such a manner that theta naught becomes one. Um, for the classical branching random walk, such scaling was done um, by various people like Biggins and Kiprianu and Idecon, um, and, and they call such a thing as boundary and that we are just mimicking that. However, for our model, theta is not just a scale parameter because if you remember, our innovations are one by theta log of yv by ev. Now that's the logarithmic term which creates a problem. And uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk about certain operators very soon and you'll see that why it is not just a scaling parameter. So we are going to consider theta equals to theta naught as a boundary case. However, we are not going to rescale it as theta naught to be equals to one. Um, that it, um, it is really interesting here that, that for the classical case, the only non-trivial weak limit with centering happens only for theta equals to theta naught. And uh, for us, we get the entire uh, spectrum for theta. For every theta, we have a um, limit. And now let me tell you about the below the boundary case uh, first and then the above the boundary case. Now in the below the boundary case, when theta is strictly less than theta naught, when theta naught is allowed to take the value infinity, we get a centered uh, uh, weak limit, where the centering is only the linear term, that there is no Bramson correction. The Bramson correction disappears. It's very interesting. There is that at the limit is, um, uh, is uh, similar. Uh, it's also a randomly shifted um, Gumbel distribution. And uh, there is the constant um, uh, shift as well, which comes from the log of the mean. This is for the below the boundary case. Now for the above the boundary case, I must confess that we don't have very precise result. What we have is uh, like the way uh, I think Lali and Salke uh, 1987 type work that what we can show that in probability limit, there is a requirement of a logarithmic correction. There, there are fluctuations of the term of logarithm, which is to be characterized in this way that if we look at RN star and we do, do the correct centering, linear centering, it, and we divide this residual by log n, it converges in probability to minus three by two theta naught. And this we can do only for mu to be equals to delta one. So this result is imprecise. However, um, uh, it indicates that a Bramson type correction is needed because of, uh, and it captures the exact correct constant. This time we are not missing this uh, three, which is very interesting. All right, so um, um, uh, this is a good time to pause. And I, ha um, uh, I was uh, just getting this uh, uh, quick uh, uh, flashes on the screen that there has been many questions. So if anybody wants to ask any question, you may please ask me now and I'll try to answer. 
before I move on to tell you that uh, what is the real story behind. So if someone wants, uh, raise your hand and maybe we can unmute or you can try unmuting yourself. So, uh, Yogesh, can I ask the question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. So, Sorry. so, so uh, this, uh, do you have any results when sort of you make uh, theta go to infinity and the limit, uh, you can sort of try to recover the classical limit from this? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's uh, my, my uh, you had almost, almost jumped to the last uh, slide. We'll, we'll come, come to that. Okay, we'll come oh. to that on Insta. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, any other question? Okay, so let me move on and I will, uh, will come back to questions again at the end of the talk maybe. So, um, so what I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you is what I call conspiracy behind the stage which is happening all over the world constantly, right? We are going through it every day almost. So um, I'm sure by now you must have realized that uh, we did not really invented this innovative last progeny modification for sake of understanding only this specific model. So uh, rather the truth is, I would, uh, I would like to say that we really wanted to give a completely different and possibly much simpler solution to the age old problem of the classical branching random walk. So IDECON work is um, um, very interesting. It's one of the um, great work of our time. However, it's very, very difficult and very analytically extensive. So what Partha and I were trying to get a very probabilistic uh, uh, proof if it can be done. And we kind of stumbled upon on this particular uh, type of uh, innovation, which uh, we gave to this modified uh, branching random walk. And uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to kind of reveal you the conspiracy of um, what is really in the right terminology is a coupling between the branching random walk problem and a very well studied process in statistics, which I'll describe uh, in the next few slides, which is called a smoothing transformation. But um, um, as I, um, um, I'm going to describe this and Anish the asked that question already, we are not there yet. Um, 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 uh, so we, so far have the concrete results only for this last progeny modified um, work, but hopefully we will be there uh, soon. Um, and this conspiracy is really by um, few operators. Okay, so, so now I'm going to tell you about certain operators which are playing uh, behind the scene and creating a lot of interesting uh, disturbances. So, um, the first one is what I call the maximum operator. So let uh, Z be the progeny point process again. And let, uh, let us recall that N is the total mass of this uh, process, which is, uh, we will assume to be finite almost surely. And we're going to denote this point process in this uh, uh, simple notation that uh, Xi1, Xi2, et cetera, are the points and uh, they are being, uh, where the point process is defined through the delta measure on them and they are being added up. So the maximum operator is an operator from the probability on entire real line, including, so I compactify it, okay, just for sake of certain uh, uh, unnecessary uh, uh, details which are always needed. Uh, they're not unnecessary, but they're unnecessary for all understanding purpose. Uh, so um, uh, probability measure on entire real line compactified to probability measure on uh, entire real uh, line compactified. And uh, what is it? So what it does is that it take IID copies of wherever it is getting evaluated and then add the innovation of come from this point process and take the maximum value. That's all it does. So that's the maximum operator. Now this is very simple to observe that the classical rightmost position of the classical branching random walk is the enfold application of this operator on delta zero because it started at the particle at point um, at the origin. Okay, 
and now comes a completely different operator okay this is called a linear operator in literature so once again the same point process and what i'm going to look into now this operator acts on the um, probabilities on the compactified positively supported um, probability measure and uh, gives a um, probability measure on the positively supported real num um, uh, on the positive compactified positive real numbers um, non negative real number more, more precisely so what is it so uh, once again it takes certain non negative random variable um, yz's and it multiplies it with exponentiation of the uh, points uh, given by the point process and add them up so it's kind of an averaging process and uh, so this is called linear because this is a linear linear uh, type of uh, functions on the on the random variables now this linear operator by the way is a very well studied operator in uh, probability and more on in statistics it's in statistics is called a smoothing operator and now i'm going to just briefly tell you um, a lot of literature are there in uh, probability uh, starting from begins in 1976 and then uh, it was studied by uh, duret and ligate in 1983 then again by lali and selke in 1987 in their seminal work on the logarithmic uh, probability uh, uh, fluctuations uh, for the branching Brownian motion. It was studied in 2000 and then in recent years by Begins and Kiprianu and many others. But in statistics, by the way, this has been in a uh, study for I don't know when. I think uh, uh, people who are working in regression. Uh, just knows it and uh, and it was first mentioned by the seminal work on non-parametric regression by Nadaria and Watson which appeared in 1964 where they introduced the so-called the carnal density estimator. So the carnal density estimator is essentially a nothing but a linear operator of the kind we said. This is also has appeared in the computer science literature and has been um, a major impact in studying various random algorithms, in particular the quick shot algorithm and its um, uh, complexity was studied by Uwe Rosler in 1992 and opened up a whole lot of uh, discussion about complexity of uh, random algorithms and the applications of smoothing transformation there. Okay, now we have the following operator. Okay, this is where I feel most excited that this is an uh, operator which um, is uh, going to link the maximum and the um, linear operator. We call it a link operator. So this, uh, this um, uh, fancy E or epsilon, it um, takes a positively supported measure to and gives on um, um, a real value supported measure. Okay, and how, what is it? It is the distribution of logarithm of Y by E where Y is um, mu, on which this operator is acting and e is an independent exponential variable and now you see this is the kind of innovations which we are going we are taking in our uh, modified model and what is the great result we call it transforming relation this is really the conspiracy of the operators that if you let the maximum operator act on the link operator then it transforms it and gives you the link operator acting on the linear operator. So it transformed the maximum to something which is a sum, which is really good because maximum is a very difficult statistics to look into. And sum being looked by so many stalwarts may have meant much more uh, things which we can handle. So um, by the way, this is why this is not a typo. This is why I call it, this is a theorem zero. This is where we really started. And this is just a simple reiteration of this uh, basic transforming um, uh, relation, giving the general transforming relation. So what I was saying that using this link operator, we can convert the problem on maximum operator to a problem on smoothing operator. In particular, perhaps we can get an easier proof of the asymptotic of Rn, the rightmost position of the classical bran branching random walk. However, we do end up in a problem, okay? And it's a very silly problem. As I said, there are conspiracy happening. So there are many silly things that are happening behind the stage. The stage is only staged, right? So there are many silly things. For example, the following, that Rn is the maximum operator. Uh, there, there, there is a typo, it should be Mzn 
n is missing acting on um, delta zero, right? That's the trivial observation. However, delta zero is not in the image of this link operator. This is because the image of the link operator can only contain continuous distributions. Remember, it is distribution of logarithm of y by v. Y comes from a positively supported uh, measure, but e is an exponential one variable and they're independent. So the resulting variable has to be continuous. So it has to have a density. So you cannot allow delta zero to be there. So we cannot immediately use the general uh, transforming relation to conclude about Rn, which we really wanted to do. Um, um, I think it would be very um, wrong. We'll go against um, Erdos to uh, not to give a uh, proof um, in a talk. So the proof I'm going to give is the proof of the basic transforming um, 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 by equation that uh, this fact holds. Okay, that's the proof I'm going to give. And I just also said that the proof and um, um, uh, there should always be a joke also. And the proof should not be the joke. Hopefully not. I guess the conspiracy is the joke, but it, it, it was really a joke on us. Uh, we really thought that we have got something uh, uh, which uh, so many people couldn't, but uh, uh, we got something different, but anyhow. So here is the proof for the um, basic transforming relation. So um, this is a very simple proof. It's of the Bistat first year probability level, but or maybe, uh, yeah, Bistat first year second semester level uh, probability. Okay, so um, um, so we have XJs which are IID with distribution this E of mu. Mu is a positively supported measure. So how do we construct it? So we construct them as logarithm of YG by um, EJ, which are um, where the YJs are IID mu, EJs are IID exponential one, and uh, they are all independent. Okay, everything is independent of everything. And um, I recall that my uh, uh, point process is um, uh, this uh, uh, bold phase Z that, that has their zijs and that is also independent of all these things is what I'm going to take. So I'm going to evaluate this particular thing, right? So by definition, this is distribution of maximum of these points of the point process being added to these xjs. What are the xjs? I have created them as logarithm of yj by ej. So I write that. Now, once I do that, it's a very trivial thing that to take the zijs inside the logarithm as e to the power zij, right? So now I have maximum of many logarithms. Logarithm is a nice function. So there is no problem of dealing with it. So I'm going to do that by doing negative of minimum. You'll see that y minimum and the negative. So I'm going to um, invert this factor as the inverse of that. And now logarithm being a monotone function, I can take the minimum inside. And now comes the real interesting one is the age old classical observation that you take a minimum a bunch of exponential, you do a conditioning argument because everything is independent. Minimum of exponentials is an exponential where the rates adds up and the rates by the way always appear at the denominator. So the denominator adds up and then this is that just the basic algebra which tells me that we get the uh, transforming relation. So it is that simple, okay? All right, so uh, what is the main idea of the proofs of our results? Um, well, so the basic transforming relation transformed the maximum operator back to a linear operator. So we also recall that that is how the, we, we gave our innovations. So now uh, here is a, a statement I am making Um, so the uh, uh, scaling limit of the smoothing transformation applied n fold times to itself should becomes a um, centered limit for the maximum with a logarithmic centering. And that's how the Bramson correction comes. 
that's the true reasons why the Bramson correction is there. And there are lots of great works of recent days also on the smoothing transformation, which we make use and we get our results quickly. And we don't need to go through all very complicated analysis of, of uh, uh, understanding the tail of this RN or RN star to get IDECON type results. The reason is very simple. Scaling limit of the uh, smoothing transformation that exists is like a more like central limit theorem. You take logarithm of it. So it's a scaling. So you take logarithm, the scale comes out to be minus logarithm. And that's what happens. Uh, but uh, because this operator transforms then the linear thing to maximum, instead of the statistics, which was sum, you get the maximum. All right, so now towards what Anish Dawa was saying, um, um, that needless Ampar, to say that... Um, Ampar, can you maybe finish in a minute or so? Could yeah, you? yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, um, so um, this is really towards trying to answer what Anish Dawa was saying, that we would really be interested about RN and not just RN star. And Rn is uh, this maximum operator uh, working on delta zero. And we can not have that because we can only handle such things and delta zero is not in the image space of this operator. So we do the following that we let theta tends to infinity and that is really what is needed. And, and, and hopefully we can uh, get such a result, um, but not there yet. Not there yet because the real problem are twofold. First of all, to do that, we need some kind of uniformity, which is still not abundantly clear to us. The other thing is that uh, there is some amount of large deviation theory needed for RN star to do that. Now, uh, Partho has done an excellent work on towards um, um, a large deviation of RN star, which we may make use for do, doing this, which he is going to present in, uh, in the StatMath seminar in Delhi next week. So those of you who are interested, I'm just advertising Partho's talk that next week, the same, um, not the same time, same day, but an hour later. So at 3.30, Partho will be speaking on his work on large deviation for RN star. But there is another approach which we are trying now. We want to do it by the below the boundary case and using cutoff on the displacement. And it seems very promising that um, um, at least we can remove the difficulty of uniform convergence for that. So that's all. Um, thanks for your um, um, uh, attending it. And um, yeah, if you have any question, please feel free to ask me. Uh, okay, uh, so first I think uh, we'll just unmute everybody uh, to uh, uh, thank uh, Antar. So all of you should be able to unmute yourself and we will give a round of applause.